All right, so uh, let's get started. The, um, uh, I guess there's only uh, one announcement, which is that uh, homework ones are going to be ready uh, in time for Shiva's office hours this afternoon. So uh, have fun mobbing Shiva to get your, uh, <coughs> get your homeworks back. If you don't want to grab them then, uh, they'll be available in uh, Michelle's office whenever you want to pick them up. Um, solutions are not quite ready, but they'll be out uh, hopefully pretty shortly. Okay. All right. So um, start with a review from last time. Uh, so we talked about the volume rule. So if you have some uh, linear transformation A that takes uh, a cube into some other weird shape, uh, the volume of this other weird shape is the absolute value of the determinant of A. Uh, and we use that as... Uh, part of the derivation of the uh, independent components analysis algorithm. So um, independent components analysis is uh, you have a bunch of uh, vectors xi, each of which is a sample from some distribution. And you want to make a statistical model of those vectors, of the distribution of those vectors. And the particular statistical model you want to make is you want to say that uh, each one, uh, that there is some um, uh, you can make vectors yi, which are uh, some nonlinear function of wxi, right? So here, that's the parameter, w, that you want to learn. And g is, for example, component-wise sigmoid, so it takes everything and squashes it into, a, um, uh, into the uh, unit cube. Right? And so if you want to view this as a statistical model, you can go backwards. Right? So you can say that uh, xi is equal to uh, w inverse of g inverse of yi. Right? And because they're all one-to-one -one transformations, that inverse exists. And what you want is to say that uh, those are generated, each component of yi is independent. So independent. independent components, hence the name independent components analysis, right? So you can think of uh, this as, so you can think of it as going this way, where you take the observation and you go and infer what the independent components were, or you can think of it as a generative model where you, you pick some distribution for the yi's that has independent components, and you apply g inverse and w inverse to get the xi's, right? Uh, and we fit that by InfoMax, uh, which is to say that we're maximizing the entropy of the yi's, which is a proxy for trying to make them satisfy the uniform distribution on the unit cube, which we pick because it has independent components. Uh, and we did that by deriving a gradient uh, and then a natural gradient uh, and getting a natural gradient descent rule. One application we looked at for independent components was analyzing natural images. So... Um, here, what I'm showing you, these are, uh, so if you fit the xi's as being patches taken from natural images, so each one of them is a vector. If it's, let's say, a 12 by 12 patch, it's a vector of 144 grayscale values. Uh, and then each row of w is a corresponding 144 uh, real numbers. And uh, you can think of it, if you reshape it into a patch, you can think of it as a filter that you apply to your image, right? And so here, this is saying that there's an edge filter, right, an oriented edge filter that's at a particular orientation and scale. Okay? And it's kind of interesting that ICA learns these edge filters because we didn't tell it it was getting image patches. Right? It uh, by itself discovered that applying a bunch of edge filters to an image is a good way to extract uh, the maximally independent uh, um, variables from it. Yeah? Yeah, so you, you can definitely... Uh, people definitely do this. You can make um, some sort of visualization of what the different orientations and scales and locations of all of these edge filters are. Uh, and people study it. Uh, I, it does something reasonable, right? Like you have a, a smaller number of large... Uh, large-scale ones that are scattered over the image coarsely, and then a somewhat larger number of medium-sized ones that are scattered over the image more or less evenly, and then a largest number of fine ones that are scattered over the image more or less evenly. 
But yeah, that's a good question. Um, and in fact, if you look at V1, it does the same thing. There's a smaller number of larger ones. More questions about ICA? All right. Um, so then uh, after we, uh, ICA was our, our uh, last example of a first order method. Uh, so we're going to do now second order methods. Um, not to spoil the, the punchline, but we are not going to cover third order methods at some point. Like, you know, maybe we'll cover them in February, right? Um, but, uh, right, so we have Newton's method, which is the, the canonical uh, second order method. Uh, so it's a way to solve a set of nonlinear equations. So if you have um, uh, nonlinear equations, uh, f of x is equal to 0, right? Um, well, so then uh, this is um, f here is a function that goes from r d to r, right? Uh, and so you approximate them by linear ones, right? So you say that uh, um, you replace f by its Taylor expansion around x and then solve for an update that brings the approximate f to 0. And you hope that that comes kind of close to bringing the actual f to 0. And so your update is you take the inverse of the Jacobian of f and you multiply it by the current value of f. Uh, and you take the step along the negative direction, right? You can also use Newton's method for finding minima and maxima and saddle points. And all you do there is you use Newton's method on the gradient g, which is equal to f prime of x, right? So here, uh, sorry, this is up here. This is rd to rd. And here, uh, f goes from rd to r, right? And now uh, the gradient g will go from rd to rd. And so we can just use this equation here, right? The Jacobian of G, which is the Hessian of F, uh, inverse times the current value of G, take a step along the negative direction. Yeah? Um, uh, we'll get to that later today. Uh, the, the, um, the short answer is regularize. So uh, you add a like you add a diagonal matrix to the Hessian to make sure it's invertible. Um, you're right. Uh, so d here is just an ordinary variable, right? Uh, it's the um, uh, it's the Newton d for direction, right? Um, and you're right. You can also use a little d to mean the the operator of taking a differential. And that is a notation conflict, and hopefully it won't cause too much confusion. If it does cause confusion, please stop me, and uh, I'll say which one I mean. Hopefully I know which one I mean at any given time. All right, so um, if it turns out that uh, f is strictly convex, then uh, Newton is a descent method, right? Uh, and you're guaranteed that the Hessian is invertible if, if f is uh, uh, strictly convex. Um, and since it's, a, since it's a descent method, you can do line search, uh, which is good because that means that you can get a guaranteed convergent algorithm, right? You're always decreasing the value. If it's bounded below, that means the value has to converge. Okay. Uh, and in fact, you often wind up getting quadratic convergence. And by quadratic convergence, I mean the really good kind of quadratic convergence, right? Where uh, the log of 1 over uh, epsilon is uh, order of the number of iterations squared, right? So uh, that means that the um, 1 over epsilon uh, it goes better than exponentially fast to zero, right? Contrast with uh, FISTA, in which one over epsilon is order uh, k squared, right? So FISTA is good, uh, but Newton is a whole uh, uh, another whole ball of wax, right? It's just it's amazingly fast to converge when you get the quadratic convergence. And it's amazingly fast to diverge when you get the quadratic divergence, which you often get when you initialize it poorly. All right? Yeah? Mm -hmm. 
That's right. And the reason is that Newton is expensive. If you have, so the question was, people use gradient descent more than Newton's method. And that's certainly true in machine learning, where we often have to solve fairly large scale problems. Uh, and Newton, the reason Newton is uh, expensive is this little inverse sign, right? That means that you know, you're spending O of D cubed if you do it at, at least in the, the naive uh, way to solve a system of linear equations. So if D is a million, you basically don't have the option of using Newton's method unless you have a lot of structure in your Hessian. Hmm? Yeah. Right, so, so uh, it could be either that the computation or the memory kills you, right? It's D squared memory and D cubed computation. Uh, but, you know, either way, if the Hessian starts getting too big, it starts getting to be a problem. This is why people often try to approximate the Hessian to try and get a, um, you know, almost Newton method that converges almost as well. And we'll mention that briefly later today. Okay. All right. So now um, let's talk about Newton's method with equality constraints, right? So uh, f of x here uh, is being shown as the contours, right, of this uh, copper-colored function. Uh, and h of x equals 0 is this nice fat green line. Uh, and just by looking at this, you should be able to tell me how many local optima uh, we have of f subject to h equals 0. Um, shall, we, shall we take a brief vote? How many people say just one global optimum? All right, we have a couple of votes, maybe three. How many people say two? How many, what's that? How many, how many local optima? So how many people say two local optima? We have a, a, that's better, that's a high, it wins over one. How many people say three? Okay, we have a, a strong contingent there, for, there as well. How many people say four or more? Okay. Okay, we have, uh, we have a couple for that. So at least within this picture, the answer, I think, is two. Um, and the way you tell that is you take, uh, you take a look for places where the gradient of F, right, so... Um, here's a place where the, uh, the gradient of f, right, is pointing along that blue arrow, right, because that's normal to one of the contours of f, right? And you want that to be uh, that if you draw a tangent to the curve, the, um, the gradient is normal to that, right? And the reason for that is if you think here's the tangent to the curve, if the gradient is normal like this, if it were pointed like this, you'd slide there and be able to increase your objective. If it were pointing like this, you'd slide that way. But if you're like this, you can't slide either way, and uh, at least not without decreasing your objective, right? So the, the sort of graphical picture is places where your constraint surface is just... Um, uh, you know, it's tangent to one of the contours of F, right? So if you look here, uh, right, we have another contour of F like that, uh, and uh, it's got, uh, you know, a tangent to G and F right there, right? Yeah. Um, there are no saddle points in one dimension, right? So there is a local, there has to be a local um, optimum, right, uh, in between the, so here, right, somewhere around here, right, that will be, uh, that will be a local optimum, right, a local maximum, let's uh, be more specific. Right, but I was asking for local minima, so there are two of those. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, how do we write that uh, formally, right? That's a nice, it's a nice visualization which works in two dimensions, but sadly we rarely get handed nice two-dimensional problems, so how do we write that? Well, okay, so uh, let's write uh, g of x is the gradient f prime of x, right? And so, um, you know, for example, this vector here is a gradient of x at this point, right? 
Um, and uh, if we look at h of x equals 0, well, the normal to that is that uh, is uh, h prime of x, right? And so what you, uh, what you want is that um, f prime of x, right, uh, is equal to some multiple lambda of h prime of x, right? So h prime here, that's the constraint normal. And f prime here is the gradient. Right. And so if the gradient and the constraint normal are pointing in the same direction, you have this picture here, where there's one plane that's tangent both to h of x equals 0 and to a contour of f. OK? So uh, just in, in general, um, we have f, which is a function from rd to r. H was a function from RD to RK, where K is less than or equal to D, probably strictly less than so that we have something to optimize over. Um, and G, this is the gradient of F, right? So G is equal to F prime. Um, this is a function from RD to RD. Uh, and uh, to get an understanding for this, let's take a look at a special case where, uh, uh, so here this is, h of x is equal to ax, right? So just a linear constraint. Um, and so the constraint set is c is the set of all uh, x with ax equals 0, right? And what we want is that um, the, uh, well, we want the uh, gradient of x to be orthogonal to c, which I'll write that way, OK? So how are we going to express that? Well, um, some vector z is orthogonal to c. Uh, that's the same as saying that uh, z transpose x is equal to 0 for all x in c. Right? Um, so just as a guess, what if we take z equals uh, a transpose lambda for some vector lambda, right? Well, then z transpose x is equal to lambda transpose a x, right? And a x, we know that's equal to 0 for everything uh, in C, and so that's 0. So um, the, the set of all uh, vectors that are orthogonal to uh, C is the set of all z that can be expressed as a transpose lambda. Right. Uh, and I guess I should say specifically for which there exists a lambda, such that uh, z is equal to a transpose lambda. Um, OK. So uh, going back to our intuition, what that means is that we, uh, in order to have an optimum, uh, what we would like is uh, that the gradient at x uh, is equal to a transpose lambda for some lambda. Okay. Um, so how do we know? Uh, I just guessed that this was going to be the right z. How do we know that we got all of them? Well, if you look at this set, right? Uh, its dimension is the dimension of the null space. Sorry, it's the dimension of the range of a transpose, right? Uh, and uh, here, the dimension of this uh, constraint set, that's the nullity of A, the dimension of the null space. And we know that the rank plus the nullity is every dimension in the space. And so every dimension we've categorized as either being uh, parallel to the constraint set or orthogonal to the constraint <laughs> set. Mm -hmm. And uh, more generally, uh, if we have uh, G of X is equal to um, the uh, Jacobian of H at x transpose lambda, right? That's what it's going to be for some nonlinear h, because you can approximate, as long as h is smooth, you can approximate it by its tangent plane at the, uh, uh, at the optimum, at x. 
Okay? So this is how we write a constrained optimization problem. Any questions about that? So that means then, uh, given that we can write it this way, uh, well, here, let's take a picture first. So um, here's, a, uh, here's a nice optimization problem. Max, uh, so we have uh, variables x, y, and z, some vector c. Uh, let's say that c is pointing straight up here. Uh, and we want to maximize C transpose times this vector subject to the vector, uh, to, to the um, length of the vector being one, right? That's this nice sphere constraint that I had MATLAB draw for me. Um, and then A, A transpose X equal B for some vector A, right? And uh, that's this nice blue hyperplane that I drew here. And you can see, uh, for example, uh, there, uh, a is going to be the normal vector to that hyperplane, right? And if we look at, uh, well, so sort of just by eyeballing it, uh, right about here is going to be the optimum, right? And if we look at the gradient there, it's going to be uh, sort of coming out this way, right? Uh, it's, that's about as well as I can draw it, right? And so if you look at the span of, uh, here's A again, and here's the, uh, the gradient um, H prime of X, right? And so uh, A is the uh, gradient of this constraint, and H prime is the gradient of that constraint, right? And if you look at the space spanned by H prime and A, that's this, um, this green space, right? This is... Uh, span of H prime and A, right? And in fact, you do have the optimum somewhere inside that green space. Mm -hmm. Right, so, uh, whoops, this is actually, sorry, what I want, uh, I wrote the wrong thing. We want the span no, that is, that is what we want. We want the span of H prime and A, uh, and we want that to contain C, right? And that's how we know what the optimum is. Okay. All right, so we can use Newton's method now to try and, make, uh, to try and find an optimum of uh, an equality-constrained problem, right? So this is just the same stuff that I wrote before. Um, and so let's write now uh, dg is equal to h of x dx, right? That's the Hessian of f. Uh, and uh, dh, this is d little h. h is the constraint function. Um, we'll write that as j of x dx for the Jacobian, right? Uh, and then the um, first order approximation of the uh, optimality conditions is going to wind up being uh, that h of x dx plus uh, j of x transpose lambda, right? So that's saying uh, that the, um, uh, the gradient here, uh, the gradient of the Hessian here, which is the gradient of G, is um, the direction of improvement is going to wind up when you add uh, some multiple of uh, J of X transpose, that's going to wind up being equal to zero, right? So that says that uh, this guy is in the uh, range of J transpose, right? Uh, and then we also have to have that uh, J of X dx, right, uh, is going to be uh, equal to minus the current value of h of x, right? So what this is doing is it's taking a step towards the feasibility, right? This is what you'd solve if you just wanted to have h of x equal to zero, right? And so now, if we write a uh, matrix n, right, which is h j transpose, all right, transpose specifically J0, right? Then we have that uh, N times uh, DX and lambda 
is equal to 0 and minus h. Make that clearly a lambda. All right? So this is kind of cool because um, this is a symmetric matrix, right? Uh, H, the Hessian was symmetric, and J transpose and J are transposes of one another, and zero is symmetric. Um, it's a uh, K plus D by K plus D matrix. So it's not, it's a little bit larger than if you had only an unconstrained problem, but it's not that much larger. Um, and if H is positive semi-definite, then N is positive semi-definite as well, right? So uh, if we had a strictly con... Uh, and if it's positive definite and the constraints are full rank, then N is strictly positive definite, right? So if we have now a problem of minimizing a strictly convex function, so that the Hessian is po strictly positive definite, and if our constraints are full rank, then we wind up getting um, a well-defined Newton direction. There's a question? Uh, no, H is a matrix, J is a matrix, right? So uh, let's, let's count the dimensions, right? So, um, so uh, let's see. H is a function from RD to RK, right? And so it's Jacobian is going to be uh, J of X will be uh, K by D, right? And G is a function from RD to RD, and so its gradient, which is the Hessian of F, this will wind up being a D by D matrix. Yeah. yeah. How did I get what? The second constraint here. Oh, this constraint here. So if you were just trying to solve using Newton's method uh, H of X equals zero, Right? You would say that you would make a step such that uh, the Jacobian times the step is equal to minus the current uh, value of the constraint. Right? So this, is, this comes from the ordinary Newton's method for solving a uh, nonlinear set of equations. Right? And then this is the optimality conditions for minimizing. Okay. All right, so um, there are a ton of examples of where you can use Newton's method to achieve something cool. Um, if you've taken a look at your homework, uh, homework two, you will notice that there is an example of Newton's method in it called the iteratively reweighted least squares algorithm. That's probably the single most common application of Newton's method in machine learning uh, because logistic regression is such a useful algorithm for machine learning. So I figured I'd pick a different one for the, uh, for the example in class, and that's something called bundle adjustment. So um, bundle adjustment is used in um, both computer vision uh, and in uh, SLAM, uh, map making, for robotics. Uh, I'm doing the uh, robotic version here, uh, the vision one, uh, basically because 2D is a little easier to draw on slides than 3D. Um, but if you look up bundle adjustment, uh, you'll find a ton of uh, explanations of the vision version online as well. So uh, the, the SLAM problem, uh, we have uh, a whole bunch of landmarks, right? So this is a landmark, YK, uh, and its position is unknown to us. Uh, we have a whole bunch of robot positions. So these are uh, XT, uh, T for different time steps. Uh, and also the uh, orientation of the robot, right? So that's theta t, uh, the difference between the front of the um, front of the robot and pointing straight to the right. Uh, and what we actually get to observe are uh, odometry and um, observations of the landmarks. So, for example, uh, odometry would tell us that uh, you know if you take the vector that this robot is pointing on, the, uh, we moved from here to here, and we rotated by that much, right? Because the thing's pointing that way now, okay? So that would be VT is the, uh, is the uh, distance we moved, and WT is the angle that we moved. Uh, and then we also get uh, DKT, which are 
uh, distances, um, distance vectors, right? So within the uh, coordinate frame of the robot at time t, right? So here's the coordinate frame of this ro uh, robot. We get a vector that goes and points at a landmark, right? And so that gives us both the range and the bearing from the robot to that, uh, to that landmark. And we get it only for some uh, subset of possible time steps and landmarks. We don't necessarily observe every landmark at every time step. And so, of course, the problem is, you know, if we knew the robot locations, we'd be able to get the landmark locations because we'd just, you know, take the average of where we believed them to be from each one of their, their observations. If we knew the landmark locations, we could get the robot locations by triangulating them the same way. But we don't know either one of them, and so we have to make an optimization to find a consistent set. Right? And I should point out, by the way, that this is underdetermined because you can take the, uh, the entire map and slide it left and right, and you won't change any of the observations. And you can take the entire map and rotate it similarly without changing anything. And you can also reflect it without changing. Well, no, you can't. You'll change the sign of all of the angles if you reflect it. So, so scratch that last one. But you can uh, translate it and rotate it without changing anything. Uh -huh. Um, all right. Uh, oh, and this notation here means that uh, the um, observation is basically the difference in angles plus some noise uh, projected onto the interval minus pi pi, right? So that we uh, don't wind up getting angles that are numerically different but mean the same thing. Okay. So uh, if we... Um, if we write that out as an optimization problem, it looks like this. So uh, I'm sure you can all implement it now. Yeah? OK. So uh, here's, the, here's the explanation, right? So this is just a copy of what we had before. And uh, to get rid of some of the nonlinearities, I'm going to, instead of theta t, um, write a vector ut, which is cos and sine of theta t. So I'm going to represent the angle by two numbers instead of by one. So. Um, here, this is the, uh, the distance that I'm supposed to have moved, right? The, um, both the, dis um, the distance forward and distance to the side that I'm supposed to have moved. And if I look at the robot position at time t plus 1 minus the robot position at time t, that's how much I moved in global coordinates. Uh, if I then rotate that by the angle, uh, robot's angle at ut, I'll get the um, the direction that I moved in local robot coordinates, right? Uh, and then I can take a look at the difference between that and my measurement and say square the difference, square the norm of the difference, and that's going to be uh, my error, right? So that makes sense? Uh, and I should point out that this function r of ut, right, that's going to wind up being u1 uh, u2 minus u2 u1, right? Like that's a linear function of the, uh, uh, of the uh, latent variable u, right? It's a rotation matrix. Uh, and then the same thing here. Um, so if I look at my uh, um, angle at time t plus 1, that should be my angle at time t rotated by my observed angle, right? And since wt is a fixed constant, this rwt is also a fixed constant. And so this is just a uh, linear, well, it's a quadratic constraint between ut and ut plus 1. Right? Uh, and then finally, this is the same thing for the uh, landmark observations. And then I have one constraint, which is that the um, length of the angle vector has to be 1. Right? I want my angle vector to be normalized. All right? And uh, so you can... Uh, take derivatives of these formulas. I'm not going to do it here, but it's basically straightforward using the tools that we've been going over for the past few lectures. One thing that I should point out is that the Hessian is going to be pretty sparse here, right? So, uh, for example, um, there'll be cross terms between uh, time step t and t plus 1, but there's no term in this objective function that contains t and t plus 2 at the same time, right? Uh, and there's cross terms between, uh, for example, um, yk and xt on the time steps where I observed that landmark. 
but there's no cross terms between two different landmarks. Uh, and this doesn't introduce any cross terms between XTs, except indirectly, right? So the fact that we have, uh, the fact that we have uh, a sparse Hessian, uh, that means that we can, uh, we can uh, solve for the Newton direction uh, D quite quickly, right? So we don't want to use the standard Gaussian elimination to solve for it, because that's going to take a um, number of dimensions cubed Time, right, and there could be quite a lot of dimensions here, right? Like you would typically think of maybe you know dozens or hundreds of landmarks and hundreds or even thousands of robot positions, right? And you you know it, you don't want to cube that if you can avoid it, and so you would solve using something like conjugate gradient, right? Or maybe preconditioned conjugate gradient use a incomplete Cholesky factorization as a preconditioner. Um, and people, saw, people use this. You can actually go to the net and download code that will solve pretty large problems. The, um, it has the same problems that Newton's method always does. It's only locally convergent. Uh, and the way that you avoid that is that you use some heuristic to uh, get you close, right? Uh, and then you, um, uh, then you uh, start using Newton's method to polish the, polish the answer and get you really high precision. Okay? So, yes? Why do you need to consume again? Oh, so um, here, u is just an optimization variable, right? It's my, my notes over here say that I want to interpret ut as cos theta sine theta, but there, the optimizer doesn't see that here. And so in order to make sure that I can interpret u as cos theta sine theta, I just have to make sure that its length is 1. Right? The question is, you know, why do we need this constraint here? Any other questions about uh, bundle adjustment? Uh, you'd have to ask one I couldn't answer. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe it's a bundle of variables that you're adjusting all at once. Um, <laughs> I guess may, uh, here's a wild guess. Uh, a lot of things would optimize individual things one after the other sequentially as you came down the, uh, as you came down the list of uh, time steps and bundle you'd adjust them all in one big bundle. Who knows? Could be right, could be wrong, but at least it's a plausible, uh, a plausible story. All right. Anybody happen to know? Anybody happen to have a connection to Wikipedia? <laughs> All right. So, um, any other questions about bundle adjustment? All right. So, um, another nice example, uh, which I'll I'll go through in maybe uh, a little bit more detail, uh, is maximum likelihood esti estimation in an exponential family. Right, and this is um, again a really useful thing in machine learning and statistics. So if we have, um, uh, so we we have a log likelihood function. So L is minus the log of the product over observations k of the probability of x k given some parameter theta, uh, and that probability is written as an exponential family, which means that uh, it's uh, x of uh, x k dot theta minus uh, g of theta, right? Where g of theta is defined as the log of the integral of x, x of x dot theta dx over your sample space capital X, right? So this is the definition of an exponential family. Um, it turns out that you can, uh, it turns out this comes up a lot, right? So for example, a normal distribution is an exponential family, so maximum likelihood in the normal distribution is an example of this. Same with Poisson or uh, Dirichlet, right? A ton of examples. So, um, so let's do the maximum, let's, uh, let's do Newton's method here, right? So we have uh, DL uh, is, well actually, so we can write L as uh, minus the sum over K, right, instead of uh, the, uh, 
product by moving the log through the product um, of uh, the differential of the log probability, right, which is x uh, k dot theta minus g of theta, right? Uh, and that's equal to minus the sum over k of, well, uh, it'll be x k dot d theta, right, minus uh, g prime of theta d theta, right? Uh, and I guess that's a uh, dot product as well, right? So um, if we define uh, the score vector uh, S K, uh, is, uh, if we define that to be uh, X K minus uh, G prime of theta, right? Then this is equal to minus the sum over K. Uh, of s k dot theta. Okay, so um, that means then that this part here is the gradient, right? That's the first thing that we need. Um, and then uh, if we um, take the uh, differential of the minus sum over k, uh, s k, right? That's what we need to get the Hessian. This is equal to, well, x k doesn't depend on theta. The two minuses cancel, and so we get uh, g double prime of theta d theta, right? Oh, and there are n of them, so uh, if we have n samples, so we get a factor of n. So that's interesting, right? Because it means that this function here, g, which is called the cumulant generating function, uh, its uh, gradient shows up in the score vector, and its Hessian shows up in the um, uh, in the uh, Newton update, right? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, another interesting thing is that um, the Hessian here it depends on theta but it doesn't depend on x, right? So it's data independent. All right. I'm sorry? Right under where I have, uh, yes, this is d theta, thank you. All right. Any other uh, typos or questions? All right, so um, that's kind of cool. Uh, what's even somewhat cooler uh, is the uh, interpretation of this, right? So the things that we're trying to interpret now are uh, g prime and g double prime, okay? So let's, uh, let's work on that. So we know that uh, the integral over capital X of X of uh, theta transpose X minus G of theta dx, that's supposed to equal one, right? Because it's a probability distribution. Uh, if we differentiate both sides of the uh, equation, right? So I'll just take the gradient on the left and the right. Um, the gradient on the right is zero, right? The gradient of one is, well, it's not changing. At least it hasn't changed while I've been looking at it. Um, so we get zero is equal to. Uh, and then gradient's linear, so it goes through uh, an integral. So it's the integral over x of the gradient of x of theta transpose x minus g of theta dx, right? Uh, and that's equal to the integral over x. Uh, so the derivative of x is x, so we get x of theta transpose x minus g of theta. Uh, and then we want the derivative 
by the chain rule, we want the gradient of what's in here, whoops, uh, which is uh, theta minus, uh, sorry, not theta, but uh, x minus g prime of theta dx. All right, so uh, we can split this up, right? So g prime of theta doesn't depend on x, and so we can pull it out of the integral, and we just get the integral of x of theta transpose x minus g of theta. We know that's 1, right? So I'm going to put that over to the left side. The negative becomes a positive, and we just get g prime of theta. And what's left? Integral over x uh, of uh, x times x. Well, actually, instead of x here, I'm just going to recognize that this is p of x, right? x p of x given theta dx, right? And you may recognize this as the expression for the expectation of x, right? So this is uh, the expectation of x given theta. So g prime gives us the uh, gives us the mean of the distribution uh, given a particular parameter theta, right? So if we go back to the previous slide, uh, if we set the gradient to zero, right? The gradient is the sum of the score vectors here. What we're saying is that uh, the mean of the observed x's should be equal to the mean that's predicted for our theta, right? Which is kind of cool. Uh, it says more or less what we'd hope, that in an exponential family distribution, the optimal thing is going to wind up matching the observed statistics to the uh, predicted ones, to the fit statistics. All right? So that's kind of cool. So now um, let's, uh, differentiating this once was fun, so let's do it twice. Um, so here, uh, right, we have that um, uh, g prime is equal to this thing, right? So uh, g double prime of theta. Right, that will equal the gradient of this thing, which is the integral over x of the gradient uh, of x times this. I'm going to write back out again. x of theta transpose x minus g of theta uh, close dx. Right? Uh, and then the uh, by the um, product rule, right? This is going to wind up being uh, the derivative of the first times the second, right? Well, the derivative of x with respect to theta is nothing, so that goes away. So then it's going to be uh, x times the gradient of this with respect to theta, right? looks like I have some kind of a problem in my notes. So I'm going to uh, not do the rest of this derivation right now. Maybe we'll come back to it next time. But the punchline is basically that we're going to be able to get the variance of theta from the, uh, uh, from the uh, Hessian. Right? So uh, the first two derivatives give us, both the, give us the mean and the variance of, uh, of x given a particular theta. So that means then that Newton's method is going to uh, wind up taking the inverse of that uh, 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 matrix, uh, the inverse of the second derivative, which is related to the variance, uh, and using it to step um, uh, based on the difference between the predicted and the observed mean. Right? So that's kind of cool. What's that? Right. 
Right. So, so you would get x, x times, uh, it would be uh, x of theta transpose x minus g of theta, right, times the gradient of that. So you would get uh, x transpose minus uh, g double prime of g prime. g prime of theta. Yep. dx. OK. And so we have uh, this first part here uh, is um, uh, is equal to uh, e of x x transpose, uh, right? And then we have um, the g of theta. Oh, right. Minus we'll get the expectation of x. The g prime of theta will come out, so it will be uh, e of x times g prime of theta transpose. But that's e of x transpose. And that's the definition of the variance. Thank you. All right, cool. The mistake was not as bad as I was, hope as I was afraid it might be. So we don't need to come back to it. We've shown that, uh, that you get uh, that Newton's method is then uh, we take the uh, variance of x given theta inverse times uh, the difference between uh, the, let's write it this way, times the difference between x bar and uh, e of x given theta, right? So that's a, uh, uh, and then uh, that will be the Newton step, right? So that's, uh, that's a, nice, a nice use of Newton. All right, so um, convergence behavior of Newton. Uh, so suppose that we have a, um, a function f, which is strictly convex and twice differentiable. Um, and I'm going to be vague right now that we have some kind of bound on the third derivative of x. right? Um, so why would that be a good thing to have? Well, suppose that we knew that the third derivative were 0. Then f would be quadratic. And Newton's method would approximate the quadratic by the exact same quadratic. We'd take one step, we'd hit the global optimum, right? So sort of because, because you expect things to be uh, nice, if the third derivative were small, in whatever the appropriate sense was, we might hope to get close to the actual global optimum. OK? So if we have a function like this, uh, what's going to wind up happening is that Newton's method is going to have uh, two phases of operation. Uh, one of them called damped Newton, and the other is quadratic convergence. Right? So damped Newton uh, is where we spend most of the time. It's where we're taking step sizes that are strictly less than 1. Right? So we do a whole bunch of uh, steps that are strictly less than 1. Uh, and then uh, at some point, uh, we switch to this quadratic convergence phase, where for the rest of the algorithm, uh, the step size is equal to 1. Uh, and we only spend a couple of iterations here because in this phase we're getting quadratic convergence, and so we don't need to spend very many iterations there to get to a very high accuracy. Okay. So um, more specifically, what's going to happen is that in this damped Newton phase, we're going to be able to derive some constant delta such that we decrease the value of f by at least delta on each iteration. Right? And so that means that, uh, well, there's a hard limit on how many iterations we can spend in this phase. Right? Because if we look uh, at uh, f of x0 minus f of x star, right? and if we uh, divide that by delta, right? if we take that many iterations, we will have gone below the uh, optimum, better than the optimum which you know, we're not that optimistic. So uh, that can't happen. And so we can have at most that many iterations uh, in this phase. Okay? And then in the quadratic convergence phase, there, there will be uh, some error metric, uh, which I'm, again, deliberately being vague about. Uh, but we'll enter the quadratic convergence, and we'll be able to show that the error, uh, well, uh, we'll 
the error is going to have to go down because eventually we have to leave this damped Newton phase and we'll enter the quadratic convergence phase when the error is less than some constant little delta, uh, which is less than a half. And then in this phase, we're going to get that the error at time t plus 1 is the square of the error at time t, right? So if it were a half at time 1, it would be a quarter uh, and then a sixteenth, right, uh, and so forth. And so uh, this is going to converge really, really fast. And the limit is basically six iterations in this phase, right? Because that six iterations is enough to get from an error of a half to better than the, trip, uh, better than the um, precision of an IEEE double, right? It gets you down to at least 64 bits of precision. And so, uh, you know, you never actually wind up spending more than six iterations here, which is why I said you spend the bulk of your time up here in the damp Newton phase. And uh, nicer problems in some sense will lead to bigger values of delta so that you get sort of a linear improvement in this, uh, uh, in this phase. Um, and then no matter what problem you are, if you're in that phase, you're good. Okay? So that's quite good behavior, right? If you have a, if you have a function which is strictly convex, uh, twice differentiable, and the second derivative doesn't change too quickly, then Newton is going to be a really, really good way to minimize it. All right. So let's take a uh, brief break now, and we'll come back in a few minutes and uh, finish up. All right, so uh, let's get uh, back started again. So uh, one thing that I wanted to do is um, do sort of a comparison of the methods that we've looked at so far for minimizing a convex function. Right? We've looked at... Uh, a pretty large number of them, at least four of them, right? Newton, accelerated methods like FISTA, ordinary gradient or subgradient, and stochastic gradient or subgradient, right? And um, so what I just said about Newton is that it has really, really good convergence, right? It has quadratic convergence when you can arrange for its assumptions to be satisfied. And so we'll give it uh, five stars for convergence here, right? Okay. Um, if we compare that with some of the other ones, right, like FISTA had uh, pretty good convergence, we'll give it three stars, right, I'd stay there. Um, and if we had subgradient uh, or gradient, right, it depends whether, uh, it depends what assumptions you make about smoothness, you'd get either an order one over k or a one over root k convergence, which I'll write as either one or two stars, right? So your motel six of the, uh, of the, convergence algorithms world. And um, stochastic subgradient, right, is going to wind up being dirt cheap, right? So we'll give it, uh, 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 but it's going to converge really, really slow, right? So uh, we'll give it just one star for convergence, OK? Um, by comparison, right, Newton can be incredibly uh, expensive as its cost per iteration, right? So. Uh, you know, you pay for what you get, right? Um, FISTA is not bad, right? You wind up having to solve the prox uh, operator on each iteration, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's a gradient and a prox computation on each iteration. Um, subgradient uh, is, uh, gradient and subgradient are basically the same price, right? Uh, you know, whether you get the good convergence or not, you still pay to compute one gradient per, per iteration. And again, stochastic subgradient, like I said, is dirt cheap, right? So, um, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, basically, if your budget is low, right, you, you use this one. If your budget is high, if somebody's buying you supercomputer time, you use this one. Um, and in between, right, depending on, you know, how rich your advisor is or something like that. Uh, and then again, um, Newton requires a fair bit of smoothness, right? It's not crazy for what its smoothness requirements are, but it's a fair bit. Um, FISTA requires less, right? Uh, and here... Um, if you don't have much smoothness, you get the slow convergence rate. If you have slightly more smoothness, you get a better convergence rate, uh, right? And here, there's basically no requirement as to what the smoothness is, right? So 
these algorithms that we've uh, told you about, they sort of cover the range from uh, assumptions about uh, you know, what you need to know about your function, how much you need to assume about the function you're minimizing, uh, what you are able to afford to pay per iteration, right? So, you know, if, you're, if you've got a web scale data set with billions and billions of entries in it, you may be stuck using stochastic gradient or subgradient. There may be nothing else you can afford, but you'll, uh, you'll only be able to get fairly slow convergence. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Subgrading, which is assuming strong convexity. Mm -hmm. which is a little bit more than which is strict convexity. Right. And you get the convergence, which is probably close to five stars. All right. If you have a, a strongly convex function and you do any of the grading methods, then we get linear convergence. All right. So I'll give it four and a half stars here. <laughs> that's a very good point. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, there's. Um, so just to repeat, uh, just to repeat what, uh, um, what happened here is that if we assume strong convexity, we can get linear convergence, which is not quite as good as Newton, but still a lot better than even FISTA, right? Uh, and the other thing that I should point out is there's lots of papers about this, right? So I might even be able to fill out even more uh, entries in this table, right? It's starting to look like I should split this subgradient column into uh, three separate columns. Right, for the different smoothness assumptions you might make. Um, yeah, so, uh, so these are very different tools for very different jobs, right? And these different characteristics mean that uh, depending on what you know about your problem, uh, it lets you select which one of these algorithms to apply. Another thing I should point out, during the break, Ryan pointed out that uh, there's another way to handle minimization with equality constraints that you guys saw in one of your homeworks, right? which is to find a basis for the null space of your constraints and use the coefficients of that basis as your optimization variables, right? You just eliminate the constraints entirely and optimize unconstrainedly within the null space of your constraints, right? And uh, as far as which to use, it's more or less six of one, half a dozen of the other. It can be usually it's about as expensive to find that basis for the null space of your constraint set as it is to solve the somewhat bigger Newton system in uh, Newton plus uh, equality constraints. Yeah. Yes, Newton diverges in some cases. Um, so if you are, um, uh, usually if you initialize too far away from the uh, optimum that you're trying to get to, right? Oh, so if you're doing damped Newton, damped Newton can't diverge on a strictly convex function, right? Uh, because damped Newton, it's guaranteed to find you a descent direction if your function is strictly convex. And so you, you get convergence there. But if you use Newton's method just to solve a set of inequalities, or if you use it to try and minimize a function that isn't strictly convex, right? Like maybe you're around a saddle point, so you don't have a descent direction, and you can't use damped Newton. Uh, that's when you start getting the, the divergence. Okay. All right. So there's a bunch of variations of Newton's method. Um, one common, uh, one popular one is what's called a trust region method. Right. So this is um, someone asked the question earlier: What do you do if H isn't positive semi-definite? Well, you just add a multiple of the identity to it, and it becomes positive semi-definite. Uh, and then you use it as, uh, as if it were the ordinary Hessian, right? And so if you make t really large here, your direction is going to wind up being a multiple of the gradient, right? And if you make t really small here, your direction is going to be the Newton direction. And so you're going to wind up interpolating between the properties of uh, Newton and the properties of gradient descent, right? Um, you can, another way to do a trust region is if you take uh, a matrix 
D, where D is equal to your uh, Hessian Hadamard product with the identity matrix, right? So you zero out the entries of the Hessian except for the diagonal. Um, this is another way to do trust region, and you have the same thing. If you make T big enough, then you wind up getting uh, a, a rescaled version of the gradient, coordinate-wise rescaled. Uh, and if you make it very small, you get Newton again, right? And the advantage of this one, the second one, is that you, um, uh, you wind up getting it uh, independent to rescalings of the coordinates, right? So uh, whereas with this one, you can rescale the coordinates and it changes the gradient direction so that uh, it'll also change this trust region direction, right? And in both of these, you lose Newton's affine invariance, right? You're interpolating between Newton, which is affine invariant, and gradient, which is not. And so you wind up losing the invariance. Right? And so a typical way that people would do this is they would start with some very small t so that you're close to Newton. And then uh, if you don't get descent, right, then you multiply uh, t by some constant bigger than 1. And you keep doing that until you start going downwards. Uh, and then you go downwards. And if you ever stop, you keep increasing t again. Um, another variation of Newton is quasi-Newton, right? Uh, and so the idea here is that it's hard in many cases to write an expression for the Hessian, and it's computationally hard to compute it. So you can use only gradients to try and build an estimate of the Hessian, right? And the idea here uh, is, um, well, suppose you have some function here, right? And you evaluate it at two nearby points. Well the slope of the line through those two points is an approximation of the derivative, right? So that's called a finite difference approximation. Um, in uh, uh, RD, you can get, um, uh, you know, if you get D gradient estimates at sufficiently nearby points, you'll be able to turn that into an estimate of the Hessian. Um, and you can often get a good enough estimate of the Hessian with many fewer than D gradient estimates, right? Which means that these quasi-Newton methods can be a lot cheaper. Uh, and in fact, people even sometimes try and forget old information to, uh, to be able to save time while still converging rapidly. Uh, and so one of the most famous of those is the euphoniously named LBFGS algorithm, which stands for Limited Memory Broyden Fletcher Goldfarb Shano who are the inventors of the algorithm. But everybody just says LBFGS. Uh, and th there's a lot of them, but that one's you know, implemented in MATLAB, and so you can just uh, you know, call it. And it's, a, it's a quite a good way to, uh, to minimize a function if you can compute gradients. Uh, all right. Uh, another variation is what's called Gauss-Newton. So again, the goal here, yeah. No, unfortunately. Uh, the question is, does LBFGS have the same convergence rate as Newton? Uh, and so in the worst case, um, you'll wind up needing more than, you know, it saves k gradient estimates, and you'll wind up needing k plus 2, right, in order to get an accurate estimate of the Hessian. And so you'll wind up getting only the convergence rate of ordinary gradient descent. But that's in the worst case. In the sort of typical case, you get a pretty decent estimate of your Hessian, and you don't quite get quadratic convergence, but it winds up being pretty fast. All right. So um, Gauss-Newton, again, the goal is to try to avoid taking uh, second derivatives. So um, it's specifically for uh, least squares problems. So if you have um, some... Uh, criterion L that you're trying to minimize uh, over parameters theta, which is the sum of squared differences between targets Y and some nonlinear function F of inputs X and parameters theta, right? And so you're minimizing over theta here. Um, so you could compute the gradient and Hessian of this. That would be ordinary Newton's method. But the Gauss-Newton idea is that instead of that, um, you approximate it by saying that um, uh, L is approximately equal uh, to, oops, this is a typo. Uh, we should put 
minimize over theta L. So I want L to be the thing inside the minimum. Uh, and so we want L to be uh, approximately the sum over K of half the norm of Y minus. And now here the approximation is going to be that it will be um, F of XK comma the current value of theta plus uh, I'll write JK times the change in theta, right? So I'm going to make a linear approximation here inside the, uh, the squared, the norm squared, right? And so here, uh, JK is going to wind up being the Jacobian of F at theta, right? So uh, it'll be that um, DF is equal to JK D theta, right? Uh, and so if I define uh, RK to be uh, Y, this should be YK here, uh, YK minus F of XK and theta, right? This is the residual for the kth point. Um, then uh, I can write that L is approximately equal to um, the sum over k of half the norm of uh, rk minus jk d theta, right, squared. And so here rk and jk I compute using the current value of theta, and then my goal is to solve for d theta, right? And so uh, I'm not going to do this here, but you can... Um, compute the gradient in Hessian, set them, to, uh, set them to zero for this thing, right? And that's much easier than computing the Hessian when you're including this nonlinear part, right? And so what you're doing then is replacing this nonlinear Newton's method with um, repeated least squares problems, right? So uh, that's kind of like Newton, right? You wind up getting that the... Um, uh, you wind up getting that the uh, the gradient is equal to minus the uh, sum of uh, j k transpose r k, right? And you wind up getting that the Hessian is equal to um, n times uh, j k uh, transpose j k. Right, and so here, what you're um, uh, this is actually the same as the gradient of this thing, but this is not the real Hessian, right? And so you wind up getting something that looks like Newton's method, but using an approximation to the Hessian. It sort of looks like Newton's method, so you might hope that it also converges really quickly, um, and you're only somewhat disappointed in that. Uh, so it's not actually even guaranteed to converge. Um, but if your residuals are small-ish and your function f is smooth-ish around the optimal value of theta, then you can converge fast-ish uh, <laughs> at, uh, at reasonable, you know, for the first, uh, first part of the optimization. Now, the fact that this isn't guaranteed to converge could be worrisome, but uh, what people usually do with this uh, is they combine it with trust regions, right? And so you're guaranteed that this is going to wind up uh, converging if you do the trust region trick. And uh, there's an, it's uh, such a good idea that there's a name. So if you add uh, trust regions to this uh, plus Gauss-Newton, uh, that's equal to uh, Levenberg Marquardt, right? And so Leven Levenberg's version is where you use the multiple of the identity as your trust region, and Marquardt's version is where you use the diagonal uh, entries of the Hessian as your trust region. And uh, Levenberg and Marquardt, they're apparently different enough that they both got their name on it. Yeah. Oh, um, 
uh, how come trust regions are called trust regions? The idea is that by picking a very large multiple of the identity, you're saying, I don't trust my estimate of this function, right? I have a, um, in Newton's method, I have a quadratic approximation to the thing I'm trying to minimize. And I'm saying I don't trust that quadratic approximation too far from my current point. So I'm going to use this regularization to keep me close to where I started. All right. So uh, I think that's a good spot to uh, stop for today. Uh, and we'll, we'll continue uh, on Tuesday.